Welcome to London, Ross. Uh, Thanks, you're going to uh, present your carbon tax proposal today in the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. um, let me start by asking, what, what are the merits of a tax on CO2 emissions purely for revenue um, measures? Um, well, as a revenue raising instrument, if you just think of it as a tax, then it would fit into the standard tax theory, which tells us that if you have to raise money for the government, the best things to tax are what are called inelastic commodities, or things that as the price goes up, the demand doesn't change too much. So cigarettes are a good thing to tax because people are addicted to them, so they'll pay even if the price keeps going up. Uh, gasoline is another one that's popular for the same reason. A lot of energy consumption is inelastic. So we've seen a lot of energy price increases over the past decade, but energy consumption remains very high, remains roughly constant. And that's because it's an inelastic commodity. And those are the types of commodities that when you raise taxes on them, you minimize what's called the deadweight losses in the tax system. If you put a big tax on something where demand collapses as soon as the price changes, that causes a lot of distortions in the market. So as a, a tax instrument, CO2 is a good target in the sense that it's based on fossil energy consumption, which is inelastic. The catch is that what makes it a good revenue raising instrument also means you can't expect to get much emission reductions as a result of putting the tax in place. And so in my presentation today, I'll talk a bit about that, that people need to understand when we talk about pricing CO2 emissions, uh, you're, the goal is to put a price on the emissions, but you're not going to get a big change in the emissions quantity itself. So in, in what way is your proposal different to the current types of carbon taxes that are either already in place in some countries or being discussed? Well, the logic of using emission pricing has been around for a long time. The idea that if you put a, a tax on emissions, whether it's CO2 or sulfur or NOx or anything like that, uh, what the people in the market do is they look for all the lowest cost ways of reducing emissions. Because anything that costs less per ton of emissions than the tax will be adopted as an abatement measure. And then they get up to the point where any further abatement measures would be more expensive than paying the tax, so people pay the tax instead. So as a result, you have everybody in the economy using all the information that's available to find the cheapest ways of reducing emissions. So that's where the economic efficiency comes in. The problem with the carbon dioxide case is there are long time lags involved both on the investment side and on the climate side. There's a huge amount of uncertainty on both sides, especially on the, the question of what the actual damages are of, of CO2 emissions. So people might agree in principle that a carbon tax would be an efficient tool for dealing with the CO2 externality, but they don't agree at all on what the level should be or how the level should change over time. So uh, you have, on, uh, at a low end, you've got um, studies of the marginal damages of, of CO2 uh, some of them are very close to zero dollars per ton or even negative dollars per ton. And then at the other end of the scale would be something like the Stern Review, which says, no, it's up in the, it's over $500 per ton, depending on how we discount future damages. So effectively, that means you, you have no agreement. And um, what my proposal does is it says, okay, as a feasible measure, if you put a tax on CO2 in at a low level and you use that revenue to reduce income taxes, you haven't done any damage to the economy and you've, in fact, you've probably made the tax system a little less burdensome overall. Then how do we adjust the tax over time? Um, I can show that if we have a suitable measure of the temperatures in the atmosphere and we come up with a simple formula that connects the tax rate to those temperatures, so then we're not imposing a, a known path for the tax. Instead, we're imposing an adjustment rule for the tax. Then that adjustment rule guarantees that we'll get a good approximation to what would have been the optimal path over time if we'd had all the information we needed to calculate it. So basically, what you're suggesting is a tax on rising temperatures, right? No, it's a tax on emissions. But 
the rate of the tax would go up if the temperature measure goes up. And so uh, if that tax were in place now and you were going to build, say, a steel mill or a pulp mill or something like that, it's going to have a 30-year lifespan and you're going to use a lot of energy. What you have to do in making your decisions about how much the energy is going to cost you over the next 30 years is form a rational expectation about what the temperature path is going to be like and then that will imply a tax path. Now if you don't think that there's going to be much change in temperature then you're going to assume that the tax is going to stay low and you can just ignore it in your planning. If you belong to the school that thinks CO2 is radically changing the climate, we're going to have rapidly rising temperatures, then you're going to build that into your planning and plan on much more expensive fossil energy and, and find alternative ways of setting up your plant. So what it'll do is uh, it'll force people to form expectations and then act on them and presumably those expectations will be based on people's best reading of the available scientific information. Okay, you, you're proposing a conditional carbon tax that is linked to the rate of uh, global temperature rises. Why do you want it to be measured in the tropical troposphere? Okay, um, yeah, this is an important aspect of it. Um, there are lots and lots of temperature measures out there. What we want is a measure that's as closely as possible tied specifically to the effect of CO2. So um, you wouldn't want a temperature measure like the uh, temperatures of the deep ocean or something where it just doesn't change over time and very long legs no matter what happens to the climate. And you wouldn't want something that changes a lot every time the solar output fluctuates, for instance. Uh, all the models that are used for analyzing global warming, all the models used by the IPCC, have identified the tropical troposphere as a region where there are relatively large temperature changes whenever CO2 levels go up. Or at least, if the real climate works the way the models work, that's where we should be looking to see a, a very rapid response to CO2 levels. So the IPCC reports point out that all the models simulate this, they all agree on this, that there's a rapid adjustment to the forcing in the tropical troposphere. And looking at the various model runs that they've done and the kinds of experiments they've done, there isn't much of a change in the tropical troposphere from normal variations in solar output or normal variations in volcanic ash and the other things that can have an effect on the climate. But there's a huge change when CO2 levels go up. So, that becomes a good indicator for us of the uh, a leading indicator, sort of, so to speak, about the effect of CO2 on the climate. It's amplified in the tropical troposphere. It's stronger there than it will be at the surface, but it doesn't have a lag associated with it. Many proponents of a carbon tax want the revenue raised um, used to subsidize green and renewable energy. Why do you call this the worst possible uh, form of use of the, of the tax revenue. Okay, so it goes back to the underlying logic of a carbon tax. So uh, what the market does basically is it comes up with two lists of abatement strategies. They're the cheap ones and they're the expensive or the ineffective ones. And the tax uh, gives everyone in an incentive to find out the cheap and effective ones and use those and ignore the expensive and ineffective ones. That's the that's the basic mechanism that gives you efficiency. Now you take all that revenue, what are you going to do with it? You're not going to spend it on the ones the market was already using. It, all that money is going to get spent on the ones the market refused to use. So the revenue from the tax is going to be used to subsidize all the costly and ineffective measures. So you just destroyed the efficiency property of the tax. So uh, with the tax revenue raised by a carbon tax, uh, it would be better to dump it at sea in terms of preserving the efficiency of the instrument than to use it to subsidize green initiatives. That's the one thing that destroys the efficiency of the policy. So what do you, what do you suggest should governments do with the revenue raised from your carbon oh, tax? The, the, uh, the best thing they would be able to do would be to use that revenue to pay for reductions in other tax rates. Because any new tax, even an environmental tax, adds to the excess burden of the tax system. It creates uh, 
all these um, dead weight losses. And uh, so you can offset those if you reduce other tax rates that have dead weight losses attached to them. And that way it just helps to minimize the macroeconomic cost of a, a tax switch to CO2. Let's say um, the next UK government were to introduce your very tax. Um, what, what do you suggest would be the starting rate of such a tax? Where, where would you um, put the, you know, the level where to start? And uh, what would the, be the cost to the taxpayer for such a tax? Uh, if, well, uh, th for the um, uh, presentations I've done, just to get the discussion started, I point out that in 2002, the government of Canada sent a letter to the um, oil and gas producers because they knew that there was all this talk about CO2 emission control measures. And at that time they said, we don't want you to have to spend more than $15 a ton. So whatever we propose, $15 a ton is going to be a backstop price and you don't have to spend more than that. And the government of Alberta has, has stuck to that. So I would say for the, the tax measure I'm looking at, okay, how about we set it so that it would have been $15 per ton in 2002. And then we have the temperature data and, and the necessary data to uh, run the tax forward from there. It turns out if we did that, the, the tax rate now would be actually negative as of 2012 um, because the, that temperature measure has, has gone down. Um, but uh, then if we decide to use moving averages or things like that, you can always keep it above zero. Um, but in a way, it doesn't really matter where it starts. You have to start at a low level, like 10 or $15 per ton wouldn't really change the price of gasoline very much. It wouldn't affect heating prices and, and uh, it wouldn't do any damage to the economy. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be noticeable. Uh, once you've got it in place, if the climate models are correct, and the, especially the ones at the high end, that tax is going to be $200 a ton by the end of the century. And, and it doesn't really matter where it starts. You can, you can get up to a very high level if those upper end climate models are correct. And then if there isn't any warming, then it stays low enough that it's not a problem and, and we avoid doing unnecessary economic damage. Um, you say in your paper that even if individual countries were to introduce this tax uh, unilaterally, they would basically benefit. Uh, but what if you know, the tax goes up and the rest of the world doesn't follow and it's just Britain, um, you know, raising its carbon tax. Isn't there a, a risk that uh, you would have some companies saying, well, this is becoming too expensive? Well, bear in mind that I'm not proposing you add a carbon tax to all the other crazy policies you've got going now. Uh, this is a really key point of understanding carbon taxes. There is absolutely no economic rationale for carbon taxes on top of an existing mix of regulatory instruments. All that does is it exacerbates the distortions of the existing mix of, of regulation. Um, I'm predicating all this on the assumption that the carbon tax is brought in instead of what's already there, not on top of what's already there. So um, it, Britain has already implemented a lot of unilateral policies and you are suffering as a result. And um, so I can certainly understand people might look at this and say, well, we don't want a unilateral tax. Um, although a unilateral carbon tax of the kind that I'm talking about would be far less damaging than the unilateral energy policies that Britain's already implemented. But the other advantage for a country, even if it acted alone, has to do with the, another component of, of the proposal, which is creating a futures market. So uh, if you go back to the example of the pulp mill, for instance, and it's got a plan for a 30-year operating lifespan. You want a bit of pricing certainty for that pulp mill. So let's say that the government auctions off certificates that are dated every year for the next 30 years. And each certificate exempts you from paying the tax for one ton of emissions, and they can be traded on a futures market. 
So now what's going to happen is the trading is going to generate a price path for those futures permits. And that price path will reflect the market's expectations of what's going to happen to the temperature. So if, if everybody thinks the temperatures are going up, then the price of those futures will go up. And then firms can invest in them and hedge against the, the risk from the policy. Because of the amount of money that would be involved, even if a single country like Britain were to set this up, because of the amount of money at stake, there would be a huge incentive to get these forecasts right. There would be a huge incentive to, in effect, depoliticize the whole issue and uh, focus in on the models that actually have a reasonably good track record of forecasting, because there are an awful lot of climate models that, that just stink at, at forecasting. They're, they're just crazy, the numbers they generate. But there might be some out there that are good, or it might require completely new types of climate models. But what would happen is the market would look for models that have demonstrated ability to forecast the climate. And those would be the ones that would get relied upon. In effect, the price path would become the world's best climate model. And then everybody would be able to look at that price path and say, that's integrating all the information that's out there about what we know about what the climate's going to do in the future. And anyone who thinks that they've got a better model, instead of complaining that nobody's listening to them, their first response should be, this is a buying opportunity for me because I know something that everybody else doesn't know. As a matter of clarification, your proposal suggests that as the temperature rises, the tax level rises. Uh, if we continue with our global warming standstill and the temperatures stagnate, the tax remains at the same level. Yeah. What would happen if we see some cooling? Then the tax would go down. Um, as I mentioned, in the, if we set it at the year 2002 at $15 a ton, then as of 2012 it would have been negative. It occasionally goes uh, negative. You could tweak the parameters so it never goes negative. Uh, I think that's cheating a little bit, but um, basically it would drop to zero. I mean, nobody's really proposing that we subsidize CO2 emissions. So, so there would be no refund? Um, I think it would be uh, a bit unusual to implement a carbon tax that turns into a subsidy for CO2 emissions, so we, we could just say, well, zero is the lower bound. But, See, I, I'm not predicting what the tax would do one way or the other. The IPCC models say that it would go up, um, well, from about 0.1 to um, 0.6 degrees per decade, so that could translate into uh, anywhere, well, say 10 to 60 dollars per decade if we set it up that way. And um, uh, certainly none of the models predict that it would stay flat or go down. Uh, your proposal has been criticized for being wait and see and people are saying this is not a proper response because it might be too late when the real warming kicks in, then it's far too late. What do you say to their critics? Well, um, they're, they're confusing the fact that in the formula for the tax rate you are using the, uh, the current uh, temperature level. So the tax rate 10 years from now, we have to wait 10 years to actually see what it will be. So that, in that sense, people think, well, it's, uh, that's too long, it's still, that's the wait and see approach. They're forgetting though that investors are forward looking and that's the whole thing that makes this a forward looking policy. Um, investors don't care what last year's tax rate is gonna be. If they're um, planning energy investments they want to know what the tax rate's going to be 10 years out. So that's where they have to formulate an expectation of what the tax path is going to be in the future. So this is the opposite of a wait and see policy. This taps into the market's forward looking behavior and makes it a forward looking policy. So it, it integrates all the available information. It's, it, creates an incentive to sift the information and, and throw out the stuff that isn't very credible and focus on the stuff that's actually demonstrably credible and, uh, and then look ahead, use that to, to construct valid forecasts. So uh, I, I have heard this, I know people think it's, it's uh, yeah, the wait and see approach or it's going to be too late by the, the time the tax goes up. Um, I think that's just misunderstanding 
the way this tax would interact with the market that it's affecting? In quite a number of countries, we have either emissions trading schemes or carbon taxes. None of these schemes are working. They're all in deep crisis. Is, what do you think is the core of the problem of the current way, particularly in Europe, the emissions trading scheme isn't working? Uh, I would uh, say that the, the question is the wrong premise. So um, if you put a tax on emissions, say of, of 20 pounds per ton, I don't know what the price is here, but put a tax Three in place of- Three pounds per ton. It's how much? Three. Okay. Three euros per Three ton. Three euros, all right. Is that the ETS price or? Okay. Well, let's say you put a tax in of 10 euros per ton and then emissions don't go down. So that wouldn't surprise me if at the price of 10 euros per ton, users of fossil fuels will still prefer to use the fuels and just pay the tax rather than uh, cut back their, their emissions. But that doesn't mean the policy failed. The point of the policy was to make you pay 10 euros per ton. So if, if, it's, if that price is in place and people are paying it, then the policy succeeded. Um, it's a mistake to think that at 10 euros per ton, you can get emissions to fall by 50%. That combination is not on the demand curve. That's, it's an infeasible combination. And this is where the idea comes in that the policies are failing because people put, think, well, we'll put a price, like a British Columbia puts a carbon tax in, it's not very high. And as a result, emissions haven't really fallen very much. So there's some talk, well, this didn't really work. Well, yeah, it worked. People are paying the fee. They just choose to emit, uh, ha having paid the fee. Same with the emissions trading system. There, the policymakers are choosing the quantity of emissions. The sense that the policy is a failure is either that there are some years where that quantity is high enough that the, uh, the price for permits collapses, or the quantity is low enough that the price soars. So there's all this price volatility and people are very unhappy about that. But that doesn't mean the policy failed. You, you get the quantity that you targeted. When you target the quantity, you don't get to choose the price. The market sets the price. And if you, the problem with an emissions trading system for CO2 is, as I mentioned, the demand curve is very inelastic. So you've got this steep demand curve, and then you set a vertical supply curve for permits. So you have a vertical supply curve and an inelastic demand curve. And uh, I don't know if listeners may or may not have ever seen demand and supply diagrams, but you just move those lines around a bit and you get huge price volatility all the time. You'll never get away from that with an emissions trading system for CO2. That's just built into the, uh, the reality. That's why economists have typically argued for um, picking the price and letting the market pick the quantity. But in Australia, it's <laughs> almost the opposite, where they actually introduced a carbon tax, mm -hmm. and now even the government, the, the new prime minister, wants to uh, get rid of it, and obviously the opposition wants to um, abolish it, and they are talking about introducing emissions trading scheme. Uh, what's going on? I haven't really followed the Australian case too closely, but I would say that what's going on is um, people don't understand the mechanisms that they're using. They, th they think you put an emissions price in, in place and you also get to pick the quantity. If they are unhappy with their carbon tax and they repeal it and then they bring in an emissions trading system, then just watch a couple of years down the road, they'll be unhappy with the price volatility and then they'll be talking about getting rid of the emissions trading system. Um, it's just an inevitable feature. That it, and it doesn't go away if you choose a strictly regulatory route. Like if you decide you're going to try to control CO2 emissions by imposing uh, carbon capture and storage rules or, or trying to introduce wind turbines or things like that, um, all those measures, whatever emissions reductions you get, they're going to cost way more than the carbon tax would have cost. Uh, it's just those costs tend to be buried. People don't get to see them as transparently as they would in an emissions trading system or a carbon tax. Now, the whole issue of carbon tax is highly contentious, particularly in North America. Um, but do you think there is a realistic chance that any policymaker or government is open for some new thinking? 
oh, there are always policymakers interested in taxes. Uh, and certainly in the U.S., for instance, I think it's uh, Senator Sanders has introduced a carbon tax proposal. Um, I have no difficulty believing that policymakers will propose carbon taxes. I think it's, it's almost impossible to believe that any of them will propose a carbon tax instead of what's already there. Like nobody's talking about, let's get rid of all this garbage to do with green energy and, and CO2 capture and all this, yeah, the subsidies, all the regulatory stuff, all the appliance standards that have been brought in and the energy efficiency standards. I mean, all these highly indirect, highly inefficient mechanisms for reducing CO2 emissions. Nobody's saying, let's just get rid of all that, clear the slate, start over again with the carbon tax. Um, maybe someday people will, um, but I'm not holding my breath about that. <clears throat> Even, uh, to me, the real prize here, if, if, if a government were to implement this, um, to me the real prize would be the futures market and the price path that it generates. Because I just think that would uh, create uh, an extremely informative set of data for people to look at. Um, and I have no idea what it would look like. But I think the market would probably just start extrapolating from observations. I think. Climate models would figure very little into that futures market because they're already so far off reality. I think the price path would probably be pretty low in terms of its trend. And so then there would be an interesting discussion because you'd, you'd have some people saying, well, the, the price path is too low. The models tell us we're going to have a lot more warming. And, and then you can respond to that and say, yeah, if you really believe that, then invest your pension in these these futures because you're saying they're going to go up in value and here they are really cheap. Instead of complaining about the fact that people are ignoring your models, uh, take advantage of it. And um, Also I think it would sift through some of the models. I don't know why we have 23 major climate modeling labs around the world using up all this money when uh, a lot of the models generate climate predictions that are no better and sometimes even worse than random numbers. Uh, we, random number generators can be bought a lot cheaper than what these climate models cost. Finally, um, obviously you get a lot of opposition from uh, green groups and, 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 and green lobbies who are afraid of losing their subsidies uh, and, and don't like the idea because all their pet projects would uh, be abolished in place of a carbon tax. But why do you think there's also some uh, concern among climate skeptics? They also, some of them, don't like the idea at all. They think uh, it's, it's a crazy idea. Um, well, I think there's a constituency out there that just don't like taxes of any kind in any form, no matter what. And so obviously this is going to uh, not go well with them. There are some that are going to argue, and plausibly so, that uh, between the original proposal and what eventually gets implemented, it'll end up being corrupted and doctored and it'll come in in some bad form, so let's not even talk about it. Um, the, uh, uh, the most reaction I've had, though, from the skeptical side has been uh, quite supportive. Uh, if anything, that's the group that is most consistently enthusiastic about this. When it's gone out on the blog discussions, I've, I've published op-eds and book chapters, and, and whenever a discussion sparks up, uh, it tends to be more the skeptics that latch onto it and say, yeah, I could support this. And I think it's because they are confident in their position, and they recognize that with this policy, you expect to get the policy you prefer. Now, um, on the green side, there have been some people that react strongly against it. I think some of it's just misunderstanding. Like I mentioned, some of them think it's backwards looking when it's actually forwards looking. Um, and I think maybe on the green side, there's also a sense that, well, if we set the tax up this way, it wouldn't actually go up all that much. And it certainly wouldn't go up enough to force us to decarbonize the economy and, and dismantle industrial civilization. And there's a constituency out there that that's really what they're after. And so 
global warming is a convenient argument for them. But if you took that argument away, they'd still want to decarbonize the economy and dismantle industrial civilization. So I'm not expecting to appeal to that constituency either. Um, one of the things that pleases me is the idea of the futures market. Uh, it wasn't my original proposal. It came from um, a law professor at the University of British Columbia named Shiling Su. He's now at Florida State. But his view of global warming is very different from mine. He's very worried about it. He thinks it's a, a big deal. I think it's not all that big a deal. But um, So we, we completely differ in terms of our expectations of the issue. But once he understood the policy, he grabbed the logic of it and ran with it and said, this, this is actually a really good idea, and ended up publishing a paper where he added this wrinkle of, if we put this futures market in with it, we now harness prediction markets and start generating a lot of information. So um, uh, I think in, in the, uh, the, the middle ground here, um, people with very diverse views end up liking it because they expect to get the policy that they think we ought to have they disagree with what they think that policy is going to look like in the end, but um, that's fine. That's based on their different expectations about what global warming is going to look like. But up front, everybody likes the adjustment rule because they think it's going to give me the policy path that I think we should have. Ross, many thanks and good luck with your proposal. Thanks, Benny.